Batteries are one of the key technologies that we use when it comes to getting to net zero, so to solving climate change. Batteries allow us to store energy in times when we don't need as much and shift it to times when we need a lot. It also allows us to move energy around, for example, in our cars. Each one of these different components, each one of these materials are mined in different parts of the world. And then when we do that, we see impacts on our water, on our land, and on local communities. When we talk about the path to net zero, we often talked about how the path goes through indigenous lands. That's because so many of the materials we want to build the technologies that we need moving forward are located on indigenous people's lands. So when we look at history and we learn from all the mistakes of the past, we can do things better as we move forward, including in bringing indigenous people into the conversation. When we look in Canada, they're engaging in some more informed consent-based processes where communities not only have a voice in the process and a voice at the table, but also have an equity stake in the project as it goes forward. That means that they engage not just in the beginning and development of the project, but throughout its lifetime. So when we look at getting these new materials into the system, geopolitics can shift. Who has power at a table can shift. And it's not just about mining, it's about the entire supply chain, from mining to processing, to turning each one of those raw components into the thing we want to use at the end of the day. This means shifting power. This means a lot of bumps in the near-term road. When we think about solving climate change and moving to net zero, it's not just about cleaning up supplies, it's about making sure that we're as efficient as possible as we make sure that everyone in this world has access to the energy they need to thrive, to have the opportunities in life that they want to have. If we don't include developing and emerging economies in the conversation, we won't get to net zero on the timeframes that we're talking about if we want to protect human health and the environment. And so it's really imperative that we bring them into conversations, that they have equal footing at the tables, and that they are part of designing the future.
We're seeing it already, for example, for voice technology for people who are locked in or people who have ALS, real ways to suddenly communicate with the world, um, which is, of course, just completely transformational and breathtaking when you think about the power of that technology. been very involved since I was a child in the kind of latest medical research to help people living with not only with spinal cord injury but all types of physical disabilities. And when you look at the potential of AI, I mean there's real opportunity there. I remember when I was on a school trip when I was probably 11 years old getting a fax, so this is going to date it, uh, from my dad. And it was the first time that he had dictated a letter himself through technology. So he'd used drag, drag and dictate software, some of you may remember it from the 90s, um, to write his own letter. And it you know, was very sweetly, it was full of typos and all of these things. But the simple act of feeling like he had agency and could send something directly without having to have another person help him was transformational. And that was for the most rudimentary version of this technology. In the space of spinal cord injury, there are increasing medical breakthroughs around what stimulating the spinal cord can do to actually trigger movement that, is, that a person can control. Again, all through highly sophisticated assistive technology. So that type of potential really is remarkable and we need to harness that innovation. How do we make sure that your definition of responsible AI isn't just something that escapes human control many years down the line, but actually is respecting people's rights and freedoms and economic opportunity now? And, and that's the real discussion, is how do we get concrete in those commitments? If you worry about long-term risks of AI either escaping human control or being used for bionuclear terrorism, some of the same mechanisms, which are transparency, accountability mechanisms, who is designing those product and who are they consulting with as they do it, are actually the same types of interventions that those of us who think about near-term human rights harms are focused on as well. And so I hope we're seeing a little bit more of a convergence and less of a dichotomy in the field. seeing medical breakthroughs. The ReFoundation continues to this day funding that work and seeing transformational changes every day. Mm -hmm.